Okay, hello. Welcome to this presentation. My name is Latko Papic. I'm the Associate Professor in Theoretical Physics Group at the University of Leeds. So today I would like to basically give you a little bit of an overview about our research. And the title of my talk is going to be It from Qubit, or it's a story about how quantum information meets quantum matter. So I'm a theoretical physicist, and for me, theoretical physics, what it is, it's about trying to gain a deeper understanding of our world. So we like to ask, you know, the big questions, where does this, all this come from, okay? So in this talk, um, I would like to ask two questions in particular, and I think these two questions are very important for you if you're thinking about studying physics, for example. So modern physics is not a particularly young subject. It has been around for about 400 years now. So I think the two relevant questions are, how did we get where we are? And what is there that's left to do? Is physics basically already almost finished in the sense that we practically already answered all these big questions? And now that's all that's left to do is just to kind of uh, apply our knowledge to some practical situations. And I think the good news is that actually, no, we are still very far from figuring everything out and uh, there's still exciting times ahead of us. Okay, so let's, um, to begin with, let's maybe see how we got where we are at this point. And we got here basically through a sequence of four so-called revolutions in physics. So the first revolution is the mechanical revolution, and that started with uh, Sir Isaac Newton. So that's basically the birth of modern physics. So for example, in the 17th century, people knew that apples you know, fall from the tree, and they knew that planets orbit around the sun, but they didn't understand that there was any deep connection between these two things. And so when, when Isaac Newton came along, he presented us with this idea that matter is a collection of particles, and these particles, they do not just move randomly, but they obey a very specific mathematical law of motion, which is called the Newton's law nowadays. So this was the first revolution in physics that completely changed the way we perceive the world around us. And it continued. Uh, for example, in the 19th century, we also have, we have the electromagnetic revolution, which was due to um, James Clerk Maxwell. So something similar happened then. So people were aware of the fact that there existed things like electricity, magnetism, and light, but they didn't see that there were necessarily any deep connections between these things. And then through the work of Maxwell, we realized that actually we had to change our view of the world to explain these things. In particular, there there was a new wave-like type of matter whose role was to cause electromagnetic interaction between the particle-like matter. So suddenly our view of the world has expanded and it became a lot richer than what it used to be. Similarly, at the beginning of the 20th century, we have the relativity revolution, uh, of course, due to Einstein. And through that revolution, we managed to unify things like space-time and gravity. So of course, in the 20th century, people knew about space and time, but they didn't see that there was any deep connection between these two until Einstein came along and he presented us with this idea that space-time is a kind of single dynamical entity. So you can distort the space-time and then you get a wave-like matter, which actually causes gravitational inter interaction between particle-like matter. So again, this was a huge leap in our understanding of the world. And then finally, we come to the last revolution, which is the quantum revolution, which was a product of many people working together in the 1920s and 1930s. And similar to the previous one, it unified certain things like atomic spectra, black body radiation, interference phenomena, which people knew existed, but they didn't see any deep connections between these things. And then of course, when quantum theory was formulated, it unified these things, but it also presented us with this quite strange view of the world that matter is neither particle nor wave, 
but it simultaneously has both of these properties. Um, so if we think about these four revolutions in physics, basically we could say that the three of them, the first three are essentially almost complete in the sense that we already understood all the big questions there. We understood what are all the fundamental ingredients necessary to formulate these theories. And what's left to do is, of course, to explore the, um, the consequences of these fundamental principles. So in contrast, this fourth revolution, the quantum one, is still pretty much incomplete and people are still debating even the very foundations of this theory. So how do these different theories actually operate? So they are, they are based on a very simple idea, which is called reductionism. So reductionism is a very, um, very simple idea that's used in all natural sciences. And it's, it tells you that if you have a complex phenomenon that you're trying to understand, what you essentially need to do is to break it down into very small parts and then try to understand each little part individually. So this is, of course, a very popular approach and many natural sciences use this idea. But if you're going to use it, you have to face the question, does this always work? Is this always guaranteed to give us the answer that we want? Or are there some situations where it actually fails? And actually, we know that there are quite a few situations where this approach completely fails. And this, these are the so-called emergent phenomena. So in these emergent phenomena, the idea is that more is different. So if you put many simple particles or constituents of something and you put them to interact with each other, they produce some behavior which is completely different from their own individual behavior. And there are many examples of this, so here are a few. So for example, traffic is an emergent phenomenon because no matter how well you think you understand the behavior of one single driver, when you put many of them together on a road, of course, they're going to produce something which is very difficult to predict, right? That's why we get traffic jams. The shape of a snowflake that we have here is another example which is very difficult to predict. And finally, in arts and humanities, we also have many examples of this emergent phenomena. So this painting uh, from the 19th century from the movement of pointillism is a very good illustration of this idea because if you zoom in on this painting and you look at any little part, you don't see anything remarkable. You just see a couple of dots, right? With the, which do not have any particular structure to themselves. But if you step back and if you look at the big picture, you know, as a whole, then you see that suddenly there's a lot of structure in it and you see this beautiful image. Okay, so let's illustrate this idea that more is different using an example from uh, quantum physics, because that's what we are interested in today. So the example of that is, of course, quantum entanglement, which is one phenomenon that cannot be described by reductionist approach. And we will illustrate this using a very simple idea of a system of two cakes. So we have a system number one, which consists of, uh, of a cake that can be in two possible shapes, either a round cake or a square cake. So that's our system number one. And we have another such system, uh, another cake, which can be square or round cake. So now we have these two systems, these two cakes, and we are going to prepare them in a certain quantum state. And that state will be such that there's an equal probability of 25% for all possible outcomes. So in this case, because we have two cakes, there are four possibilities. They could either both be round cakes or they could both be square cakes or they could have different shapes. And the probability is the same for each of these outcomes, okay? So now let's do a, an experiment where we detect the state of the first cake and we find it to be a round cake. And the question is, did we learn anything useful about cake number two? So let's analyze. So if the first cake is a round cake, then it means that it could be either the first scenario here, or it could be the second scenario here. 
these two possibilities are not cannot happen because in those the first cake is actually a square cake so if it's one of the first two outcomes now let's ask ourselves did we learn anything useful about the second cake well from the first two possibilities we learned that the second cake could be either a round cake or it could be a square cake with the same probability right because it was 25 percent so the probabilities are the same so the point of this experiment is that by detecting cake number one it didn't actually tell us anything useful about cake number two because you know we knew in the beginning that the second cake could be a round or a square cake right so this is the case when there's no entanglement between the cakes okay so now let's change uh, this experiment and we prepare the cakes in a slightly different state where we have just 50 50 percent probability for the cakes to be of different shapes and now let's do exactly the same experiment we measure the first cake we find it to be a round cake did we learn anything useful about second cake so now if we find that the first cake is round it means that the second cake actually has to be a square cake okay because this possibility is eliminated since we know that the first cake is not square so the point here is that in this case when we detected cake number one we automatically learned something about cake number two we are now sure that the second cake is actually a square cake and this is what happens when the cakes are entangled so doing something on cake number one told us something about cake number two that we didn't know in the beginning and of course the, the strange thing about this experiment is that you can separate these cakes even to the opposite corners of the universe and quantum mechanics would still tell you that measuring something on cake number one would tell you something about cake number two no matter how far apart they are from each other so quantum entanglement is an extremely mysterious and uh, fascinating phenomenon but uh, what's important for us today is that actually it has very direct manifestations um, because it leads to the formation of new phases of matter which we call topological phases of matter so when we are in primary school of course we learn that matter can exist in three forms as solid liquid or gas and then later on we learn that there's also plasma as another phase of matter but actually those four are far from being uh, you know the more all there is to to the phases of matter and uh, there are in fact as we learned in the last 30 years there are new kinds of phases of matter where particles are extremely entangled with each other and this gives them a completely new uh, properties and such matter is called topological quantum matter so in this type of matter particles form some kind of loops and braids as you see here and because of that they have very non-local properties just like these cakes separated at opposite ends of the universe so they affect each other very very um, in very subtle ways and um, so how do we realize this kind of matter so we can realize it in many experiments and uh, one material which is very popular in recent years is graphene so if you write with a you know pencil on a piece of paper there's a trail which is left behind right and you can take a scotch tape as somebody has done here and then you can just try to peel off um, you can apply the scotch tape on this trail and it will essentially peel off layers of this uh, of this uh, pencil trail and each layer consists of a, a honeycomb array of carbon atoms as we see here under the microscope and that's graphene so that one dimensional layer of these carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb array that's that's graphene and so in this kind of material if you put it in a strong magnetic field it will realize this topological quantum matter which has very fascinating properties and that's something that our group is actively investigating and this is an extremely uh, topical and um, vibrant area of research um, that was also recognized by the Nobel Prize in Physics just a few years ago uh, which was awarded to these uh, three uh, brilliant physicists 
And I was very happy about this Nobel Prize because uh, Duncan Haldane, who is one of the recipients of this prize, used to be my postdoctoral advisor when I worked at Princeton University before I came to Leeds. So this is a fundamental reason why we care about this research and why we do it in Leeds. But uh, there are also practical reasons for doing this. And one of them is that these kinds of phases of matter could have applications in quantum computing. So quantum computing, of course, is something very popular in recent years. As you see, various uh, press articles are being written about this because there's a huge uh, global um, you know, competition uh, who is going to uh, design uh, these kinds of machines because they are believed to be strategically much better than any kind of ordinary computers that we have right now. And as you see here, some companies are already producing machines like that, which look huge. They are enormous in size. They have to be cooled down to extremely low temperatures and they have to be very well isolated. So they put them inside of these huge uh, boxes to shield them from any kind of environmental influence that will degrade their performance. And so one of the possible applications of this topological quantum matter is that they could be used as a building block to actually design more resilient uh, quantum computers. And this is the idea of topological quantum computation. So the idea is because these, uh, this topological matter, the particles there are already kind of entangled and they sense the presence of each other very, in very subtle ways. So they are able to somehow counteract this you know, environmental negative influence which degrades the performance of these devices. So if we are able to use this new kind of matter as building blocks of these computers, they're expected to be a lot more robust than you know, uh, the versions that some companies are producing like this. Okay, so basically that brings me to the end of my presentation. So what I wanted to convey to you today is that theoretical physics and especially quantum physics, quantum theoretical physics, is an extremely exciting and vibrant area of research with many of open questions, many of the big open questions that we're still um, struggling to understand. And the main, the main difficulty in all that comes from the fact that we still haven't been able to unify three different things, which are matter, interaction, and information. So we are still struggling to make this final step in the quantum revolution. And that's why all this is so exciting. It's basically, it gives us a glimpse into new kinds of universe where new types of matter could exist. So if you maybe remember this painting from the Middle Ages, this is exactly how we feel doing this kind of research. So this painting illustrates, so this was at the time when people believed that, you know, the earth was like a flat disk, right? So um, this person walked basically, um, they walked until the end of that disk. And so, so they discovered the end of the world and then they, they peek their head through this, you know, horizon and they see that there's a whole, in, you know, whole new strange universe on the other side. And this is exactly how we feel doing this research um, that I described to you today. And the other message is that it's not just fundamentally exciting to do this kind of research, but it also might have very tangible applications in terms of using these new materials that we are discovering as a possible building block of uh, new types of computers in the same sense that, you know, we use uh, silicon materials uh, for, you know, our older uh, technologies of existing computers. And so just before I conclude, uh, so um, I'm part, as I mentioned, I'm part of the theoretical physics group. And so that's a recent photo of our group. And if you're interested to find out more about what I told you today and anything else related to our research, which is extremely broad, as you see here, uh, you're welcome to um, go to our webpage. So thanks again for joining this presentation and uh, take care. Bye-bye.